This is the final lesson in our series on chemical bonding. In our previous lesson, we used the VSEPR model to help us determine the shape of molecules. In the task for the lesson, I asked you to determine the shapes of three hydrocarbons, ethane, ethene, and ethine. I'd like to start this lesson by looking at the models I have built of these molecules. Of course, I applied the VSEPR model to help me determine their shapes. In ethane, there are two carbon atoms and six hydrogen atoms. Let's look at the bonds formed on one carbon atom. Here, this carbon forms three single bonds with three H hydrogen atoms and a single bond with the other carbon atom. So there are four bond pairs that need to be arranged as far away from each other as possible. The shape that makes this possible is the tetrahedral shape. The same arrangement takes place around the second carbon atom and so we have two tetrahedral shapes joined together. The bond angle between the carbon atoms is 180 degrees, but each of the hydrogen-carbon-hydrogen -hydrogen bond angles is 109,5 degrees. For ethene, there are two carbon atoms and four hydrogen atoms. A double bond forms between the two carbon atoms. Three things can be arranged in a trigonal planar shape. So in the model of the ethene molecule, the bond angle between the carbon atoms is 180 degrees, but the hydrogen-carbon-hydrogen -hydrogen bond angles are 120 degrees. For ethane, there are two carbon atoms and two hydrogen atoms. A triple bond forms between the two carbon atoms. Around each carbon atom, we have one hydrogen-carbon bond pair and one triple bond. There are only two things to arrange in space, so the shape is linear. And here I have my final model. Even though I have been able to use the VSEPR model to predict the basic shape of the molecules, the model does not give any indication about another very important geometric feature, size. Atomic and molecular size are very important factors to consider when studying chemical reactions and chemists have spent a lot of time developing technologies to measure these very accurately. They use x-rays to measure atomic radii and the distance between two nuclei in a molecule. This distance is known as the bond length and is a measure of the size of the molecule. The overall size of the molecule is related to the strength of the chemical bonds formed within the molecule. Chemists have measured the energy required to break a chemical bond and called this bond energy. Bond energy gives us an indication of the strength of a chemical bond. In this lesson, we will analyze the factors that influence bond length and see if bond length and bond energy are related to each other. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to recall the factors that affect the length of a bond. Analyze bond length and bond energy measurements and describe the relationship between bond length and bond energy. Can you suggest how the length of the bonds between two carbon atoms changes as the number of bonds increases? Another way to help you see this relationship is by using metal wire models to represent the orbitals in each of the molecules. In the ethane molecule, we have four bond pairs around each carbon arranged in a tetrahedral shape. Two of the orbitals overlap head-on to form a single sigma bond. Let's compare this to the ethene model. In one carbon atom, we have 
a p orbital and three other bonding orbitals that are arranged in a trigonal planar shape. The same arrangement is found in the other carbon atom. Here is the sigma head-on overlap. I've made the length of this sigma bond the same as in the ethane molecule. Now the 2p orbitals overlap sideways. But these p orbitals hardly can overlap. To get more overlap, these sigma bonds need to be shorter. As you can see, as the number of bond increases, the bond length decreases. Let's check out the data chemists have recorded by using x-rays. The bond lengths are measured in picometers, that's 10 to the minus 12 times, or a million million times smaller than a meter. This is an extremely small distance, smaller than the wavelength of light, and that's why an optical microscope cannot detect chemical bonds. X-rays have a much smaller wavelength and can be used to measure the bond lengths very accurately. The data in the table clearly shows that bond length decreases with the increasing number of bonds. This confirms the relationship suggested by the models. Now let's have a look at some molecules that all have the same number of bonds but have atoms of different sizes to see if atomic size and bond length are related. How about the halogens? Remember, the halogens are diatomic molecules that are found in group 7 of the periodic table. They all have a single sigma bond formed by a p-p overlap. Notice that the size of the halogen atoms increases as you go down the group because the valence electrons are found in energy levels that are further away from the nuclei. Fluorine is the smallest atom and iodine is the largest atom. By looking at the data about the atomic radii, can you predict the bond lengths formed when two of these atoms combine to form a diatomic molecule? I have used these cardboard circles to represent atoms of different size. You can have two small circles overlapping for a small molecule like fluorine and two larger circles overlapping to represent a larger molecule like iodine. Now notice that the distance between the centers of the smaller circles is much less than the distance between the centers of the larger circles. So this model predicts that the larger the atomic radius of an atom, the larger the bond length of the molecule. Let's check out the bond lengths measured by using x-rays. Well, clearly, the size of the atom does affect the bond length. The larger the atom, the longer the bond. Now let's turn our attention to bond energy. Remember that this is the energy required to break a chemical bond. One of the models scientists use to describe a chemical bond is to think of it like a vibrating spring. In this model, bonding pairs of electrons move backwards and forwards continuously. The bonds do not only vibrate, but also rotate around the axis between the nuclei. Have a look at the spring models representing ethane, ethene, and ethine. Here is a single long spring joining two balls together. This represents a single bond formed between the two carbon atoms in ethane. Next, we have two shorter springs that represent a double bond as found in ethene. And here are three even shorter springs that represent the triple bond found in ethene. 
in which of these models will most energy be required to pull the balls apart? Clearly, the balls in the model with the three short springs are hardest to pull apart. This suggests that the greater the number of bonds and the shorter the bond length, the more energy required to break the bonds. Let's look at measurements for bond length and bond energy for ethane, ethene, and ethine to see if they confirm what the model suggests. Chemists cannot measure the energy needed to break the bond of a single molecule, but they can measure the energy required to break a very large number of molecules, a mole. For this reason, bond energy is measured as kilojoules per mole. When a graph of bond energy is drawn for the hydrocarbon molecules, you will notice that the bond energy increases as the number of bonds increases. You can also see that the bond energy increases as the bond length decreases, just as the model predicted. But does this trend apply to other molecules? Well, let's examine the halogens again, where there is only a single bond between each of these atoms. Have a look at the spring model I have for these molecules. Here I have a long spring and here a short spring, each connecting two balls. The short spring seems to hold the balls tighter together while the long springs connect the balls more loosely. It is also easier to stretch the long spring than the short spring. What prediction can you make about the relationship between bond length and bond energy from this model? Let's look at the values chemists have determined. Well, here's a surprise. You would expect the bond energy to be highest for fluorine with the shortest bond length, but it isn't. It is highest for chlorine, which has the second smallest bond length. The bond energy does decrease as the bond length increases for bromine and iodine, but fluorine doesn't fit in with the general trend. Fluorine is the most reactive non-metal on the periodic table. The fluorine molecule is unstable and requires very little energy to break the fluorine, fluorine bond. This might explain why fluorine is an exception to the general trend that bond energy decreases with increasing bond length. To confirm this trend, we need to look at some more data. Here is a table of bond length and bond energy data for different bonds. I would like you to use this data in today's task. Select four different bonds where the data confirms that bond energy increases when bond lengths decrease. Draw a graph to show this trend clearly. When you examine the data, you will see that some bond lengths are similar, but the bond energies are very different. Check to see how the electronegativity number difference of the bonds vary, and see if you can determine a trend between electronegativity number difference, bond length, and bond energy. Well, this brings us to the end of this series on chemical bonding. I hope you have enjoyed seeing how different models can be used to explore how atoms combined and how models can be used to make prediction about the nature, shape, and size of different molecules. Yeah.